So in the last class, we discussed that with the help of a few rules, <clears throat> around eight to nine rules, very easily we can construct an approximate root locus for a given system, and the approximate root locus actually serves our purpose. So let's learn the rules, how to construct the root locus. Now the first rule, can you see the material? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Zoom what are that? No, ma'am. Okay. So the first rule is First rule states that the root locus will always be symmetrical about the real axis. That means sigma axis. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. So <clears throat> about the sigma axis. So what is the rationale behind this rule? We know that the roots of the characteristic equation can be real or complex conjugate pair or any combination of this two, right? So that means the root locus that will be always <clears throat> passing through the roots of the characteristic equation. Hence, the root locus will be symmetrical, always symmetrical about the real axis. Now, for construction purpose, actually, this rule doesn't help us much for construction of the root locus. But why this rule is so very important? Because after constructing the root locus, after sketching the complete root locus plot, if you find that the root locus, your plot is not symmetrical about the real axis, that means the sigma axis of is plane, then something is wrong somewhere. That means your root locus is not a correct root locus, right? So after constructing the root locus, please check whether the root locus is symmetrical about the real axis. Now let's <clears throat> consider that a system, a generic kenneth order system actually contains n number of roots of the characteristic equation. That means n number of closed loop poles of the system. And when we know that the value of gain k will be zero, the closed loop poles will be identical to the open loop poles. So let's assume that a system does contain a number of open loop holes and a number of a, a number of open loop zeros. So a number of open loop holes and a number of open loop zeros. Right? <clears throat> now, already we have seen that when the value of gain k will be equal to zero, the root branches will originate from this n number of open loop poles. Right? Now, <clears throat> why? This is our characteristic equation. So this characteristic equation QS can be written as product over n S plus Bj plus K into product S plus Zi equal to zero. So the characteristic equation can be expressed in this form as well. Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. So now, if the value of gain k is zero, that means all these terms will be zero, right? And what will be the, what are the n number of roots of the characteristic equation under this particular situation? The roots, n number of roots are located at is equal to minus pjs. And what are these pjs? Pjs are 
the locations or minus pages are basically the locations of the open loop goals of the system. Have you understood this? That's why when the value of gain k will be equal to zero, n number of root branches will start, will originate from n number of open loop poles of the system. Clear? Please respond. Yes, ma'am. Now, <clears throat> the second rule also states that if we go on increasing the value of gain k and if k tends towards infinity, then out of this n number of root branches, out of this n number of root branches, n number of root branches will terminate onto n number of open loop zeros. Again, I repeat, as k tends to infinity, as k tends to infinity, out of this n number of root branches, n number of root branches will terminate on n number of open loop zeros. Generally, in the real life system, the practic for practical system, we know that m is less than n or at best m could be equal to n. m cannot be number of zeros of a system cannot exceed the number of poles of the system. The system will not remain causal under that particular situation. So as k tends to infinity, out of this n number of root branches, m number of root branches will terminate <clears throat> on m number of open loop, po uh, open loop zeros. Now you see, this equation, if we divide this equation by k, then the characteristic equation can also be written as 1 by k product j going from 1 to n, all these terms, s plus pj plus, since we are dividing the equation by k, so now this term will be product i going, i varying from 1 to m, s plus z i is equal to z. So from this equation, it's clear that if k tends to infinity, if k tends to infinity, now all these terms will be zeros, right? And only will get m number of roots of the characteristic equation. Hence the rule, as k tends to infinity, m number of root branches will terminate onto m number of open loop zeros, right? Now, the question is, the question is, if m is less than n, then what will happen to the rest n minus m number of root branches as k tends to infinity, right? So this second rule also states that the third part of the second rule is, as k tends to infinity, the rest n minus n number of root branches will tend towards infinity. Tend towards infinity as k tends towards infinity. Clear? So I am reading out this rule. As k increases from 0 to infinity, each branch of the root locus originates from an open loop pole with k is equal to 0 and terminates either on an open loop 0 or on infinity with k tends to infinity. The number of branches terminating on infinity equals the number of open loop poles minus zeros. Right? Now the last part can also be proved you see this equation, or if we consider the magnitude criterion, this is the magnitude criterion or inverse of rather inverse of magnitude criterion. So product of i varying from 1 to m, magnitude of all this s plus z i's whole divided by product of z varying from 1 to n s plus pj's magnitude of all this 
is equal to 1 by k, right? We are familiar with this expression. Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now do it. Now from the numerator, from the numerator, from each factor, let's take a score. Unless you interact, please mute, please mute your device. Okay, so let's take S common from uh, each and every factor in the numerator. So the fact the, the term that we get out of this product sign will be S to the power M. And within this bracket, the terms uh, would be 1 plus Zi by S. Done? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll do the same thing for the denominator polynomial. Again, we'll take S common. So, out of this product sign, we'll get a term which is S to the power N. And within this bracket, the terms would be 1 plus Pj by S. Right? We are considering only the left hand side of this equation. <coughs> so effectively, we'll get a term in the denominator of the left hand side, which is denominator will get a term which is s to the power n minus m. Can you follow? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, <clears throat> this equation will reduce to the uh, numerator will be product magnitude within bracket. The terms would be 1 plus zi by s. In the denominator, we'll get s to the power n minus m product j varying, j varying from 1 to n within bracket will get terms 1 plus pj by s and in the right hand side we know the value is 1 by k right so now let's assume a point on the s plane which is one onlookers point but the point is at infinity right so that trial point if you take a trial point, which is on locus point, you're assuming that the point is one on locus point, but the point is at infinity, then that particular point is zero can be represented as infinity e to the power j phi. A zero is complex, so it will have a magnitude as well as a phase angle. Since the point is lying at infinity, hence the magnitude will be infinity. And this is the phase angle part. Here. Is it clear? So far is this clear? Yes, ma'am. So if we put the value of A in this equation, you see in the denominator, we do have a term which is S to the power N minus A. And all these terms are zi by s, pi by s. So if s tends to infinity, then all these terms will reduce to 1. So 1 into 1 into 1 in the numerator and 1 into 1 into 1 in the denominator. And in the denominator, we are getting one term, which is s to the power n minus a. So the left-hand side will be 0. 
the value of the left hand side will be zero as is is tending towards infinity the magnitude is infinity right and k is also tending towards infinity so the right hand side is also zero so what can be concluded from this it can be concluded that the rest n minus m number of root branches will tend towards infinity as k tends to infinity Have you understood this rule? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll discuss this rule, the third rule. Actually, there is no specific sequence in this book. They have followed this particular order. So let's first discuss rule number four and five as given in this book. So <clears throat> because rule number four and five are directly related to this particular rule, that is rule number two. Again, I repeat, there is no specific order. You'll have to apply all the rules for one by one in any order for construction, uh, for constructing the root locus of a given system. So the next rule, already we have learned that n minus m number of root branches will tend towards infinity as k tends to infinity. Now this n minus m number of root branches will tend towards infinity along straight line asymptotes, along straight lines, and we call those straight lines asymptotes, and the straight lines will have angles given by this formula. So this is the asymptotic angles. So phi A denotes asymptotic angles. A stands for asymptotes, right? And phi A will be 2Q plus 1 into 180 degree, whole divided by N minus M, number of open loop holes minus open loop zeros. And in this equation, you see, n minus n number of asymptotic angles will have to compute, right? So in this equation, q will vary from 0 to 1 to 2 up to n minus n minus 1. Since the first value of q is being assumed to be 0, hence q will vary up to n minus n minus 1, and hence we'll get n minus m number of asymptotic angles, right? So if we get this asymptotic angles, the slope of this asymptotes, then we'll be able to draw the asymptotes on the plane. Yes or no? So with the help of this rule, we can find out the slopes of the straight line asymptotes along which the root branches <clears throat> will tend towards infinity. So if we can compute the slopes, then it's possible for us to draw the straight lines on the spin. Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. So we can draw a straight line if only the slope is known to us. answer this question. <clears throat> Can we draw a straight line if only the slope of the straight line is known to us? Some point is required. So, <clears throat> why did you say yes, we can draw? Some points are, if the slope is known, only one single point would suffice. Have you forgotten how to draw a straight line? Anyway, if you don't want to interact, then I can't help. So along with the slopes, at least we need a 
point through which the straight lines will pass. So the point is how to compute the point that is given in the following rule. So the asymptotes, all the asymptotes, all the straight line asymptotes will cross the real axis at a particular point. That means all the straight line asymptotes will pass through a real point. That means will pass through a point on the real axis and that point is known as centroid. I don't know whether it's legible or not. Centroid. C-N-T-R-O-I-D. The point is called centroid and centroid can be computed using this formula that is sum of real parts of poles minus sum of real parts of zeros. Remember sum of only real parts of the poles poles means open loop poles minus sum of real parts of open loop zeros divided by n minus m this n minus m that is number of poles minus number of zeros. <clears throat> centroid is denoted typically denoted by the symbol sigma a because this is a real point the point is point will be lying on the real axis that's why we use the symbol sigma and a stands for asymptote so <clears throat> sigma is the centroid and sigma a the centroid can be calculated using this formula that is summation of real parts of poles minus summation of real parts of zeros whole divided by number of poles minus number of zeros right now in this equation i would suggest you to ignore this minus sign why <clears throat> because suppose uh, uh, for a given system if the value if this value comes out to be equal to minus 2 then you might get confused and your conclusion would be sigma a is equal to 2 only instead of being minus 2 you might get confused and you will note that sigma a is equal to 2 which is incorrect right so that's why just minus sigma in general minus sigma a has been considered here to be the centroid so just ignore this minus sign and sigma a will assume the value that you have computed <coughs> from the right hand side so it could be if the value comes out to be equal to plus 2 then the centroid will be located on the uh, positive real axis at s equal to 2 right and if the value comes out for example if the value comes out to be minus 2 then the centroid will be located on the negative real axis am i clear Have you understood this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And also, please do note that centroid is not an onlookers point. Right? So, it might so happen that after computing the value of centroid, you may find that, yes, it's lying on the loop, uh, locus, root locus. But actually, centroid is not an onlookers point. It may lie on the locus. It may not lie on the locus. doesn't matter. Centroid is the point on the real axis through which all the asymptotes will pass. So now we know the point as well as the slope angles of all the asymptotes. Hence, on the S plane, we can construct all those n minus n number of asymptotes. Also, look at this equation so if n minus m is equal to 3 n minus m is equal to 3 right the asymptotic angles will always be 60 degree 180 degree and 300 degree right so at the asymptotes along the asymptotes the root branches some root branches will tend towards infinity right 
So uh, let's take one example that uh, a minus m is equal to 3. Then one asymptotic angle will be 60 degree. The other one will be 300 degree. So again, you see the asymptotes are symmetrical. And the second one is 180 degree. So asymptotes are symmetrical about the real axis. If the asymptotes are not symmetrical about the real axis, then <clears throat> automatically the <clears throat> root locus will not be asymmetrical along about the real axis. Got it? Ma'am, please repeat. Which part? Last part. Let us consider that the difference of number of open loop poles and open loop zeros is equal to 3. The difference is 3. So n minus m is equal to 3. So in this case, q will vary from 0 or q will assume values. Look at this equation. We will assume values 0, 1, and 2. n minus m is equal to 3. So n minus a minus 1 will be 2. So the values of q will be 0, 1, and 2. So if we put the values, then the first asymptotic angle, since n minus a is equal to 3, that means three root branches will tend towards infinity, tend towards infinity along the straight lines, along the three straight asymptotic straight lines as k tends to infinity. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what are the asymptotic angles? For Q is equal to 0, the angle will be 180 degree divided by 3. That means 60 degree. So when the value of Q will be equal to 1, so the asymptotic angle sigma A2, the second angle, second <clears throat> slope of the second asymptotic straight line will be equal to 180 degree. Yes, ma'am. And when Q is equal to 2, that means the asymptotic angle, the third asymptotic angle will be equal to 300 degree. Yes. Right? So you mm -hmm. see, the asymptotes are also symmetrical, 60 degree, 300 degree, and 180 degree. So asymptotes are also symmetrical about the real axis. Is it it? Yes, ma'am. So, what did I say? If the asymptotes are not symmetrical about the real axis, then the root locus will not be symmetrical about the real axis. Because the root branches will move along the asymptotes towards infinity. Do you get my point now? Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Right? So, <clears throat> the first point was the root locus should be symmetrical about the real axis and that can be verified from this particular rule as we find that yes the asymptotes are also uh, asymptotes are symmetrical about the real axis hence the root locus the final root locus will be symmetrical about the real axis and similarly if n minus m <coughs> if the difference is equal to 4 then the angles will be 45 degree and odd multiples of 45 degree. Here, so 45 degree, if I'm not wrong, 135 degree, then 425 degree, and the last one will be 350 degree. Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. And if n minus a is equal to 2, then what will be the asymptotic angles? We'll get two asymptotes. And what will be the asymptotic angles? 90 degree and 270 degree. Yes, plus minus 90 degree, right. And if n minus a is equal to 1, then the asymptotic angle will be 1 degree simply. One single asymptote. Here. So now let's come to this particular rule. So 
the rule states that now before discussing the rule uh let's try to understand the essence of this rule now using this particular rule we'll be able to find out the segments of real axis which will lie on the root locus right so which portion of the real axis are actually on locus segment on locus segment that can be found that can be determined with the help of this rule so if we take any point on the real axis then the point on the real axis will lie on the root locus if the number of real open loop poles plus real open loop zeros lie to the right of the point is odd i repeat a point on the real axis a point on the real axis will be one on locus point if the number of real open loop poles plus real open loop zeros lying to the right of the point is odd <coughs> So let's see what's written over here. A point on the real axis lies on the locus if the number of open loop poles plus zeros on the real axis. That means real open loop poles and real open loop zeros are being considered. Lying to the right of the point is odd. So what is the basis of this rule? First, let us consider one example. Suppose. A system is given for which the open loop poles are located at this point on the SP. So how many open loop poles are there? One, two, three, as well as this. You see, these three open loop poles are real open loop poles. Real open loop poles. Okay. And along with these three real open loop poles, two complex conjugate open loop poles are also present in the system and these two are the two complex conjugate open loop poles okay and also two open loop zeros are present so given the open loop transfer function of the system for constructing the root locus first we'll have to locate the open loop poles and zeros on the s plane as it has been done in this particular in this particular case so now let's take an arbitrary point on the s plane an arbitrary point on the s plane and this is Suppose this is the trial point A0, and we are trying to find out whether this real point or this point on the real axis does lie on the root locus or not. Now you see, to find out whether this point is lying on the root locus or not, we'll have to apply angle criterion at this particular point, right? No, now, <clears throat> for doing so, what we'll have to do? We'll have to construct all this visa. That means S0 plus P2, S0 plus Z1, S0 plus P1, S0 plus Z2, S0 plus, I guess this is P3. Okay. As well as these two phases, this one and this one, here. Have you understood this? Yes, ma'am. Now you see, this open loop pole is lying to the right of this point. To the right of this point. Okay? Pressing the page, we see that 
this open loop pole is lying to the right of this point and the angle contribution of this phasor at this trial point is 180 degree or minus 180 degree clear yes ma'am similarly <coughs> Let us consider this zero, which is lying to the right of this trial point. And again, we find that this phasor is contributing <coughs> an angle, which is plus or minus 180 degree at this point. The same reason is valid for this point as well. Now let's look at this particular open loop zero. Now this point lying to the left of the trial point. And you see the phase angle contribution by this phase at the trial point is zero. Simply it's zero. Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. Similarly, phase angle contribution of this open loop pole, which is <clears throat> lying to the left of this trial point, is again zero. And complex conjugate pole pair, you see this is the phase angle contribution of this phaser, and this is the phase angle contribution of this phaser. So together, the phase angle contribution of this two complex conjugate pole pair will be zero. Similarly, if we do have complex conjugate zero, open loop zeros, the phase angle contribution will again be zero. Got it? Yes, ma'am. So, we can generalize this case and we can say that if NR be the If NR be the number of real open loop poles, real, remember, <coughs> real open loop poles to the right of the trial point, and if MR be the number of real open loop zeros lying to the right of the trial point, right? The smaller stands, you can assume that. This R denotes lying to the right. So NR is the number of open loop, real open loop poles lying to the right of the trial point, and MR is the number of open loop zeros, real open loop zeros lying to the right of the trial point. Then the net angle contribution at the trial point will be MR minus NR into 180 degree. Right? Do you agree? Do you agree? And why it is MR minus inner? MR is the number of open loop <coughs> zeros lying to the right of the trial point, right? <clears throat> so, angle contribution by zeros are positive and angle contribution by the poles are always negative. Yes, so, each pole is contributing an angle of minus 180 degree and each zero is contributing, rather each real open loop zero is contributing an angle of plus 180 degree. So if MR be the number of real open loop zeros and NR be the number of real open loop poles to the right of this trial point, then at the trial point, the angle of GSHS will be MR minus NR into 180 degree. Now is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Actually, MR into 180 degree minus NR into 180 degree. So, 
effectively MR minus NR into 180 degree. Now it's clear. Yes, ma'am. So <clears throat> if the point is an on locus point, then at this point the angle criterion will be satisfied. And what is our angle criterion? That means for the point to be an on locus point. This MR minus NR into 180 degree should be equal to plus minus 2Q plus 1 into 180 degree, where Q is varying from 0 to 1 to 2, etc. Right. So from this equation, from this condition, we find that MR minus NR should be equal to 2Q plus 1, where Q is an integer. That means MR minus NR. This difference is odd. Do you agree? <coughs> Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> so, if MR minus NR is odd, then easily we can say that NR plus MR will be odd. Yes, ma'am. And hence the rule. Again, I'm going through the rule. A point on the real axis lies on the locus if the number of open loop poles, real, real open loop poles plus zeros or open loop poles plus zeros on the real axis to the right of this point is out. Now, a couple of observations could be made if you look at this figure. You see, this real open loop poles and zeros actually divide the real axis into some segments. So this is one segment, this is another segment, this is the third segment, and this is the fourth segment having an infinite length. Again, I repeat, if you look at this diagram, pole zero diagram, then it will be clear that all this real open loop poles and zeros are dividing the real axis into some segments. All right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So <clears throat> on this particular segment, you see, we have taken, in this particular segment, we have taken a point and we have found, applying the rule, we have found that this point is on one on locus point. That means this point will lie on the root locus. So, <coughs> if this point does lie on the root locus, then all the points on this particular segment will lie on the root locus. Why? Because if I shift this trial point <coughs> towards right, and if I make the trial point to be a point like this, and if I apply the rule, then I'll find, yes, the number of open loop real poles plus zeros are still equal to 3, 1, 2, and 3, right? So this point will also be an on-locus point. Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. Similarly, if I shift the point towards left on this particular segment, somewhere over here, you see number of open loop poles plus real open loop poles plus zeros lying to the right of this point remains same. So all the points on this segment will be on locus, uh, on locus points, or we can say that this segment, the complete segment, will be one on locus segment, right? So if a point on a segment is one on locus point, 
that all the points on the segment will be omlocus points unless we cross one real open loop pole or zero either <clears throat> in this side or in this side. So while we are shifting the point and in the process, suppose we are shifting the point in this direction and in the process if we cross one real open loop pole in this direction, then you see for this point now, number of real open loop poles plus zeros becomes two, that is even. Hence, this point will no longer be one onlookers point. Am I clear? Yes, ma'am. Similarly, while shifting this point, we cross the zero, real open loop zero in this particular direction. Then now the number of real open loop poles plus zeros will become four. And hence, the rule will not be satisfied. And hence, this point will not be an onlookers point, right? So if we start with this particular segment, you see, take any point on this particular segment and try to find out number of real open loop poles plus zeros to line to the right of this point, you'll find only one single open loop pole, real open loop pole. That means the number is odd. Hence, the entire segment will be one on locus segment. Here, now if we cross the zero or pole in this direction, and if we consider this segment, that any point on this particular segment, you'll find the number of real open loop poles plus zero is now is equal to two. That means it's even. Hence, the entire segment will be not on locus segment. Here, again, we cross one real open loop pole. So this segment will be one on locus segment. Again, we cross a real open loop zero. And this segment will be a not on locus segment. So on the real axis, you see, the onlookers and not onlookers segments do alternate. Have you understood this? Yes, ma'am. So let's take one example. This is the open loop transfer function, GSHS, there's a unity feedback system. So GSHS, the open loop transfer function of the system is given by K into S plus 1 into S plus 2 divided by S into S plus 3 into S plus 4. So it's clear that <coughs> the system does have two open loop zeros located at minus 1 and minus 2 and three open loop poles located at s equal to 0, s equal to minus 3, and s equal to minus 4. So number of open loop uh, poles is equal to 3, and number of open loop zeros is equal to 2. So n is equal to 3, and n is equal to 2. So n minus n is equal to 1. Right. So, <clears throat> how many root branches will be there? Since there are three open loop poles, right? So, if we form the characteristic equation or if we draw the closed loop configuration or if we find the closed loop transfer function, then we'll find that <coughs> the transfer function is a third or a uh, or the closed loop system will be a third order one. Hence, three closed loop poles will be there or the characteristic equation will have three roots. So when the value of gate k will be equal to zero, three root branches will originate from this three open loop poles. And open loop poles are located, as I said, at s equal to zero, s equal to minus three, and s equal to minus four. Now out of this three open loop 
sorry, out of these three uh, root branches, since the system has two open loop zeros, so two root branches will terminate on to this two open loop zeros as k tends to infinity. And the rest, that means the third root branch will tend towards infinity along a straight line asymptote as k tends to infinity. Right? And since here n minus m is equal to 1, hence the number of asymptotes will be equal to 1 and the asymptotic angle will be, what will be the value of the asymptotic angle? 180 degree. 180 degree. That means the third root branch, 180 degree, means the negative real axis. So the third branch will tend towards infinity along the negative real axis. Now, we have discussed only four or five rules. So with the help of these rules only, we can construct the complete root locus and this one. And one terminates on infinity. This part is not, this word is not legible. So we can uh, draw the complete root locus for this system. So the first task is to <clears throat> place the open loop poles and zeros on the S plane. So this is one open loop pole denoted by a cross. This is the second open loop pole located at S equal to minus 3. And this is the third open loop pole located at S equal to minus 4. Two open loop zeros, one at s equal to minus one, the second one is at s equal to minus two. Right? So already we know that three root branches will originate from these three open loop poles. Now we identify the segments of the real axis, which are on locus segments and which are not on locus segments. So apply rule number three or the rule that we have discussed just now. So take a point on this particular segment and number of open loop poles plus zeros lying to the right of this point is one that is odd number. So this entire segment, you can mark it with a different color for your better understanding. So, <clears throat> this entire segment is one on locus segment. And naturally, the next segment, the next segment will be one not on locus segment. As you can see, again, the third one, this is this one, this one will be one on locus segment. Take any point, count the numbers. 1, 2, and 3, so odd. So the entire segment will be on locus segment. This is one not on locus segment. And this segment, this infinite length segment starting from this particular point, will be one on locus segment. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Now, one root branch is originating from this particular open loop pole. And you see, this is the on locus segment. So the root branch that is originating from this open loop pole can't move along this direction. So the root branch will have to move along this direction only. Isn't it? Yes or no? Um, minus one take is it a part of zero? Minus one take is zero. Huh? Minus one take is zero. Zero. Open loop zero. Open loop zero. So when the value of gain k will be zero, root branches will originate from open loop poles or open loop zeros? 
তো পেলো পোলস তাহলে এখান থেকে কি করে অরিজিনেট করবে এখান থেকে অরিজিনেট না করলে তো এদিকে মুভ করতে পারবে না ওকে ইয়েস ম্যাম আন্ডারস্টুড ইজ ইট অ্যাবসলিউটলি ক্লিয়ার ইয়েস ম্যাম হ্যাঁ রুট ব্রাঞ্চ গুলো তো প্রত্যেকটা ওপেন লুপ পোল থেকে অরিজিনেট করবে রাইট তারপরে যেমন তুমি গেইন কে বাড়াবে अकॉर्डिंगলি তোমার রুট ব্রাঞ্চ গুলো লোকাস গুলো ডেসক্রাইব করবে তাই না ইয়েস ম্যাম so the root branch will have to originate from this point only which is the open loop pole and since this is the on locus segment hence as we increase the value of gain k the <clears throat> this particular root will describe a locus or root will change along this path in this arrow direction please note arrow directions are masked on root locus a uh, plot for each root branch so the root branch will move along this direction and as k tends to infinity the root branch will terminate on to this open loop zero right similarly the second root branch <clears throat> let's call it the second root branch the second root branch will originate from this open loop pole only and you see this is one not on locus segment not on locus segment that means the points on the segments are not the roots of the characteristic equation whatever be the value of a and k okay only this segment is one on locus segment on locus segment so the root which is or the root branch which is originating from this open loop pole will have to move along this direction and in the process as gain k will increase towards infinity the root branch will find one open loop zero and the root branch will terminate on to this open loop zero when k tends to infinity right and what about the third root branch the third root branch will originate from this open loop pole located at s equal to minus 4 and you see already we have computed that the asymptotic angle is 180 degree that means the negative real axis and this portion of the negative real axis this segment this infinite length segment of the negative real axis is a uh, is one on locus segment right the entire entire segment up to infinity is one on locus segment. so when k is equal to 0 the third root branch will originate from this open loop pole and as we go on increasing the value of gain k the root branch will <clears throat> tend towards infinity along the asymptotic straight line having an asymptotic angle 180 degree or in other words along this segment on the real axis clear yes ma'am and this is the complete root locus so you see very easily we can construct the root locus and this is not only the an approximate root locus is it is the exact root locus so for any value of gain k is equal to say k1 if we fix the value of gain k to a particular value say k1 so for k1 will find the root on this particular branch will find the second root on this particular branch and will find a third root on this particular branch here you have any question have any question so 
So now let's <clears throat> consider another example. Now in this case, you see the characteristic equation is given 1 plus k into 1 by s into s plus 1 into s plus 2. So this is the open loop transfer function GSHS. 1 plus GSHS is equal to 0. So we find that this system doesn't have any open loop 0, but the system does have three open loop poles located at s equal to 0, s equal to minus 1, and s equal to minus 3. So <clears throat> the first conclusion uh, the uh, first conclusion is three root branches will originate from these three open loop poles when the value of gain k will be equal to 0. And since there is no open loop equal to 0, Hence, all the three root branches, all the three root branches will tend towards infinity along straight line, along three straight line asymptotes as gain k tends to infinity. Clear? Yes, ma'am. So, to construct the root locus plot for this particular system, first on the is plain you locate you please all this open loop poles one at s equal to zero at the origin of this plane other one at s equal to minus one the third one at s equal to minus two okay now we can find out the asymptotic angles already we have discussed here n is equal to 3 and n is equal to 0 so n minus n is equal to 3 and Look at this example, they have calculated, yes, the asymptotic angles will be, for q is equal to 0, it will be 60 degree. So we'll get one straight line asymptote having a slope 60 degree, the second straight line asymptote having a slope 180 degree, and the third straight line asymptote having a slope 300 degree. Now, to construct the asymptotes, to draw for drawing uh, the asymptotes, we'll have to find out the centroid. Otherwise, we'll not be able to find out the asymptotes. So the centroid of the asymptotes is given by real paths of the poles minus real paths of the zeros, number of poles minus number of zeros. So the denominator is pretty simple. That is n minus n. And the numerator, it will be no complex conjugate pole pair. If complex conjugate open loop poles are there, only you'll have to consider the real path. So <clears throat> this one is zero. So minus one, minus two. Minus one, minus two divided by three. So sigma A, sigma the centroid, the value of the centroid is minus one. So it will be located on the negative real axis at a point where sigma is equal to minus 1, right? So let's look at the sketch. So this is one open loop pole. This is the second open loop pole and this is the third open loop pole, right? So this particular segment, you see, this particular segment is one on locus segment. Agree? Yes, ma'am. And this segment is not on locus segment, whereas this segment is one on locus segment. Okay? Already we have uh, computed the centroid. And what was the value of the centroid? I guess it was minus one, right? Yes, ma'am. So this is the centroid. It is in this case it's co-located with one open loop pole. Anyway, we are not bothered about the location of the centroid only. Centroid is required for drawing or <clears throat> construction purpose of the asymptotes. So you see we have drawn one straight line asymptote having a slope 60 degree. We have drawn the second a straight line asymptote. All these asymptotes will pass through this centroid. So the second asymptote will have an angle which is 180 degree. And this is the third asymptote having an angle which is 300 degree. And as I said, now look at this figure. You'll find that the asymptotes are symmetrically 
placed on the S plane. Okay. So next, <clears throat> since this is one on locus segment, so the root branch, which is originating from this open loop pole when A is equal to zero, will <clears throat> move along this direction because it's, it can't move in this particular direction. So it will have to move along this particular direction. Similarly, the second root branch, which is originating from this open loop pole, this open loop pole, okay, when k is equal to zero, will have to move, as k increases, will have to move in this direction, in the direction of the branch arrow. Why? Because this segment is not one on locus segment. So the root branch, which is originating from this open loop pole, cannot move in this direction. So it will have to move in this particular direction only. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. And the third root branch, it's uh, quite straightforward, will originate from will originate from this open loop pole and will tend towards infinity along this asymptotic line having an angle which is 180 degree. Right. Now let's again focus on these two root branches. So this root branch is originating from this open loop pole and moving in this particular direction along the real axis. Similarly, this root branch is originating from this open loop pole and moving in this particular direction along the real axis. Hence, these two root branches, these two root branches are called real root branches. This is one real root branch. This is another real root branch. Now, you see, for a particular value of gain k, this two root branch will meet at a point on the real axis. Can you recall this case? One real root branch moving along this uh, in this direction one real root branch moving along this direction and these two root branches <clears throat> did meet at this point for a value of gain k which was equal to s square by 4 and recall this case yes ma'am this so the same thing is happening So these two real root branches will meet at a point on the real axis for a particular value of gain k. Now, if you increase the value of gain k beyond this value, then these two root branches will break away from each other, will break away from their meeting point and they will form to complex conjugate root branches complex conjugate root branches and one as we go on increasing the value of gain k one root branch will tend towards infinity along the straight line asymptote right and the second root branch will also tend towards infinity along this straight line asymptote have you understood this? I'm konta niche jab aur konta upore jab aate ki bojha jabe. Nor karne hi to bojha. Amar to three the root power niye kotha. So for a particular value of gain k, which exceeds the value of gain k at this point, suppose the value of gain k is k one. So I'll get a point, I'll get a root on this branch, I'll get a second root on this branch, and I'll get a third root on this branch. Okay. It's not, <clears throat> doesn't matter because the root branches are symmetrical. 
identical identical only in this case will get to complex conjugate closed loop codes do you get my point yes ma'am just you have to draw these two root branches so you see one root branch is tending towards infinity along this asymptote the other one is tending towards infinity along this asymptote and the third root branch is tending towards infinity along this asymptote clear so for the time being till now we don't know where this two root branches only one thing is not known to us that is where these two real root branches <clears throat> will meet that is not known to us but what about the stability of the system can you uh, conclude anything about the stability of this particular system you see when we discuss the second order system we find that the system will remain stable for all values of gain a varying within the range 0 to infinity now is that conclusion valid for the system as well for the system no ma'am it depends on k it depends on k why because if it if the root locus uh, Uh, go to the right half plane, then uh, it will be uh, unstable. System. Right. So this is the limiting value of k, right? For a, we'll get a limiting value of uh, gain k, uh, for which the root locus in this case, you see, the root locus will intersect the imaginary axis, and if we now increase the value of gain k beyond that particular value. beyond that limiting value you see two root branches are moving in the right half of the s plane so that means two roots of the characteristic equation this third root will always remain confined in the left half of the s plane whereas in this case two roots two roots will lie in the right half of the s plane that's making the system unstable right so the system will be stable within the range of gain k starting from 0 up to this value which is some k is equal to k1 or k limit right and you understood yes ma'am <clears throat> so in this case two real root branches are meeting at a point and after that they are forming two complex conjugate root pair and look at this complete root locus what's your conclusion is it symmetrical about the real axis or not symmetrical about real axis yes So this root locus certainly it's symmetrical about the real axis this one is also symmetrical about the real axis and the first one is obviously so after completing the sketch of root locus we state whether the root locus is symmetrical about the real axis or not now in this particular diagram we find that this is the point on the real axis at which the two root branches are meeting with each other so we can argue like this that this point is common to this branch as well as to this branch or in other words we can say that this point lies on this root branch as well as this point lies on this root branch do you agree yes ma'am so what is you see this point has been leveled as 
breakaway point. So what is the significance of the breakaway point? At breakaway point, we'll get roots of the characteristic equation with multiplicity greater than 1. Or, in other words, at the breakaway point, we'll have repeated roots of the characteristic equation. Understood? Yes, ma'am. So if two root branches approach each other and meet at a point, then the point will be called a breakaway point and the uh, order of multiplicity will be equal to two. So we can generalize this concept and we can say that if n number of root branches or let's, okay, fine. We should not, should not use any because there will be a conflict symbol. So let's consider R. R number of, if we assume that R number of root branches approach each other and meet at a point, right? Then at that particular point, we'll have a root of the characteristic equation having an order of multiplicity equal to R. Ma'am, please repeat. You see, in this case, two root branches are meet, uh, approaching each other and meeting at this particular point. This is the breakout point. So at this point, we'll get two <coughs> roots with identical values. Yes, ma'am. That means order of multiplicity, repeated root, order of multi uh, repeated roots, order of multiplicity, multiplicity is equal to two. 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 Right? So we can generalize this. Instead of two root branches, if we assume that our number of root branches are approaching each other and meeting at a certain point, then at that particular point, will get repeated roots of the characteristic equation? Yes, ma'am. And what will be the order of multiplicity? How many roots will be located at that particular point? The order of multiplicity will be equal to R. Or at that point, we'll get R number of repeated roots. <clears throat> now, is it clear? Yes, ma'am, understood. Okay. So this breakaway point, the next rule states how to compute this breakaway point. So the breakaway point is basically a solution of this equation dk ds equal to zero. dk ds equal to zero. So let's consider this equation. So this is the characteristic equation, right? So we can write, let's note down, A by S into S plus 1 into S plus 2 is equal to minus 1. Done? Done. That means K is equal to minus, in the right hand side, K will be equal to minus S into S plus 1 into S plus 2. Have you understood? Yes, ma'am. That means we'll have to express k as a function of s. So if we can exp express k as a function of s, 
then we can take first derivative of a with respect to as and we can form this equation dk ds is equal to 0 and the roots of the or rather to be precise sum of the roots of this equation will be the breakaway points for the system So far, what we have discussed, do you have any question? Do you have any question? If you don't have the question, then I'll end the session.